Hi, I'm Pastor Steve with Screaming Rock Ministries, presenting Faith and Hope for Today. Genesis is the beginning of the recorded history of humanity and reveals that God has a plan, has always been there for us, has already defeated evil. Will you join us for a thought-provoking journey to the solutions of life's complexities? It's just really great to be back uh, with you again this week. We have an extraordinary presentation. Uh, If you have a child coming or a grandchild that needs a name, we're going to go through some of the most unique names, I think, in the Old Testament. So you want to pay careful attention if you're looking for new names for children. And I'm going to tell you right up front, some of those names are a real tongue twister. So I hope you enjoy it. But the second half of our presentation today is vitally important because it is a covenant God made that is one of the most unique covenants, I think, in the Old Testament. So you want to be really taking notes on that. I I think there's some truth in that that is astounding. So I want to take you to our picture. Uh, This is coming up Highway 97. Uh, the, The open prairie that you're looking at and the hills and that range uh, you can't see it, but uh, in some of the other photos of this region, there is about a half a dozen wild horses just in the foreground that you will have opportunity to see in some of the other pictures. In fact, this is like open range where they graze. Sometimes you can see a couple dozen out there. So I hope you enjoy that. And I really am hoping that today's presentation will be a great blessing. So, Faith and Hope for Today presents Genesis, the beginning, Abram's vision. Now, when we jump into the story, um, we're going to give you a glimpse of the nature of civil strife that exists in the land of Canaan. This is the land before there is an Israel or an Arab empire. I mean, we are going back centuries here. Uh, where it's tribal kingdoms and city-states, you're going to find out that where Abram went is just extraordinary. If they were to make a movie of this, this would be quite stunning. I think you'll discover that. So let's go to Genesis 14, verse 1. Bear with me as I work through some of these challenging names. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Cheder Laamor, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, and they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah. So it's five kings who are oppressing or oppressing their neighbors. Um, extortion through force is what we're talking about here. Now, as we continue the story, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. Now, did you catch that, the phrase, that is? That occurs several times in this chapter, at least twice. Now, I need to help you understand why king of Bela is Zoar. It's because, remember Moses was a graduate from the University of Egypt. So notice in this chapter, Moses is correcting some of the names, like he's updating the kings to a more current text of the language of the day. So he's telling you what the ancient story is, but now he's telling you what the contemporary interpretation of those stories are. And that's one thing that makes chapter 14 so fascinating to me. So I hope you enjoy that. Moving on to verse 3. All these things came as allies to the valley of Shittim, that is, the Salt Sea. 
Now, the Salt Sea, you would know it today as the Dead Sea. Twelve years they had served Cheddar Laomor, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Cheddar Laomor, the king, and the kings that were with him came and defeated the Rephaim and Ashtaroth, Carneum, and Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in Shava Karathame. It's like watching Lord of the Rings almost. These incredible names of these ancient places. Verse 6. And the Horites in, the, in their Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to In Mishvat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites, also the Amorites, and those who lived in Hazazon Tamar. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, came out, and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidon. So now you have this entire region embroiled in war. Almost sounds like contemporary experience happening in the Middle East today, doesn't it? In verse 9, against Cheddar Laomor, the king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Now, you know, when they talk about oil in the Middle East, in, in Genesis, what Moses is telling us is the tar pits, that oil was on the surface of the earth. Uh, there were tar pits. Uh, did you know there's tar pits in L.A.? Uh, in Los Angeles, you can go right down to the tar pits, and they've excavated some of those tar pits and found some really remarkable animals that were caught in them. It says, Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them, but those who survived fled to the hill country. I don't know, falling into a tar pit would be a very nice thing to experience. Notice verse 11, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all the goods, all their food supply, and they departed. So their purpose was to extort the defeated tribes and city-states threaten them, intimidate them, conquer them, and then just take all of their food and their supplies, everything they could carry, and take it back to their place. It was just like open robbery. These were challenging times. Now, here's the crux of the story. Verse 12. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions, and departed for he was living in Sodom. So when Lot took the Jordan Valley, he did not settle in the outer valley. He actually moved into town. Now, we learned why this history was told. Lot finds himself caught in the middle of war. This is a major predicament because Lot has no way out in this story. He chose the best land, the most fertile land. He chose the best for himself. And now he has drama unlimited. This is not looking good for him. In verse 13 it reads, Then a fugitive came and told Abram, the Hebrew, now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, and the Amorite brother of Eskel, and the brother of Aner. These were the allies with Abraham, Abram. And when Abram heard that his relative had been captive, or taken captive, he led out his trained men. Now, I want you to notice that on your screen that I've put these words in yellow for you. Born in his house, 318 went in pursuit as far as Dan. So here's what I want to say about this. This army of 318 soldiers started, I mean, these were born in the compound, Abram's 
clan, if you would, which means that Abram had a massive community that traveled with him. And he had an army. These young men were born and raised and trained in Abram's camp. His house was extraordinarily large. He had immense wealth for his day. I don't want you to miss that. He had his own army, but as you read through the history, you recognize he needed his own army because of the amount of violence that was in the land. We just discovered that Abram had invested and trained an army for defense because this is hostile, hostile territory. 318 soldiers. Now, that doesn't mean the rest weren't trained. This was just his special army. Verse 15, he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Abram and his forces were skilled at both defense and assault. They were able to go and defeat, listen carefully, those five kings. So I want you to understand that Abram wasn't just a herdsman. He wasn't just a good businessman. He also was skilled at defense and protecting what was his. It says in verse 16, he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative lot with his possessions and also the men, oh, I'm sorry, the women and the people. So everything these five kings had taken, Abram has rescued. He now is taking this massive amount of things taken back home. It says in verse 17, then after his return from the defeat of Cheddar Laomor and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the Most High God. You know, throughout the test, Old Testament, when you read about various places, you will discover that in many of these countries there was always someone who was a representative of the Creator God, the God Most High. And I find that to be interesting. These people were not left without someone representing God. And in verse 19 it reads, He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And it says he, that would be Abram, gave him, that would be king, the priest king Melchizedek, a tenth of all the spoils. Now here's what's really interesting to me. The concept of returning a tithe to the priest of God most high, the one-tenth, preceded Moses' teaching on tithes and offerings in the book of Leviticus and in Numbers and Deuteronomy and Exodus where the children of Israel kind of were relearning what it meant to be the people of God. This takes us back to a principle. I mean, this goes back centuries as a principle of acknowledging God through tithe. In this case, to Melchizedek, the priest king. And in verse 21 it reads, The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. That sounds like a generous offer, doesn't it? But pay attention now in verse 22. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. For fear that you would say, I have made Abram rich. Now, isn't that interesting? 
Abram did not want to give credit to anyone around him that they somehow made him who he was. He was a man who was faithful to God and could say, God has blessed me. In verse 24, he says, I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Anner, Eskel, and Mamre, and let them take their share. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. Genesis 15, chapter 2. I want you to pay careful attention. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer, the of Damascus and Abram said since you have given no offspring to me one born in my house is my heir then behold the word of the Lord came to him saying this man shall not be your heir for one will not come forth but one will come forth from your own body he shall be your heir and he took him outside and said now look towards the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. It says in verse 6, Then he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? Now, before we go into that covenant, I want you to understand a truth that is revealed here. The entire foundation of Christian religion, and may I say all godly religion that is truly the religion of God, is in verse 6. It says, Abraham believed in the Lord, and the Lord reckoned or credited to or gave it to his account to him as righteous. Our righteousness here is a gift through belief, not through behavioral changes. It was his belief in the Lord, his yes to God, the act of faith, by saying yes to God, God credited to him righteousness. That is Christianity. Any Christian religion that includes tradition or works or other right behavior to prove to God you are righteous is contrary to Christian faith. That is an important point. Notice verse 8. He said, Lord, how may I know that I will possess this land? Let's get on to that. This is an important conversation. And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Verse 10. Then he brought all these to him, cut them in two, and laid them each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. In other words, the birds were opposite each other, but they were whole. This is an ancient form of an, a covenant, of a contract. Why did he cut them in half? Well, because the way this contract works, this covenant works, is, are you ready for this? If you break the covenant, what's been done to these animals will be done to you. Note that. It says, the birds of prey came down upon the carcass and Abram drove them away. Now, at this point, Abram is awake. He's done everything conscious and fully aware. Now notice verse 12, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell on him. And God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not there. There they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. So Abram is looking clear up into the future where all of Israel is taken into slavery before the exodus in Egypt. And it is a great darkness 
a horrific vision, the oppression that would take place to his descendants has been fully revealed to Abram. Now notice what God says. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. As for you, Abram, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In other words, there is a probationary period for the Amorites still to turn back to the Lord before the exodus is to take place. And that's over 400 years into the future, 430 to be exact. That is a probation given to the Amorites to turn back to the Lord and to repent. Isn't that just amazing? Now notice this carefully. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch. This is a symbol of God which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river Euphrates. So, understand this. Think about this. You have these animals cut in half. You have God who is going to pass down the middle of this path of these animals that have been cut in half. And what is God saying? That if this covenant fails, may the same thing happen to me. Now, we do have Abram walking through chasing the birds away. But in this story, I want you to notice that we really don't have formally Abram walking through as part of this covenant saying that if I break this covenant, the same thing will happen to me. And I'm going to say this because I think it's really important. This covenant is based on fulfillment entirely in God's hands as he alone is able to bring it about. He is taking full 100% responsibility in this covenant. He owns it. He's willing to risk all to make sure this covenant is fulfilled on behalf of the descendants of Abram, who was declared righteous by faith alone. And by the way, you are also declared righteous by faith alone, as there is no other way to be righteous. So here we have this amazing covenant that has taken place. We have, now just let's digress here. We have the war, we have the deliverance, we have the victory. We have Lot returned. Now Abram returns home, tells his story to Sarah. I'm sure everyone gathered around to hear all of the events. And now God comes along and he's going to make this covenant. And what is this covenant? That the descendants of Abram will take possession of of this land as a faith covenant Abram entered into. So the full possession of that land as the children of Israel never had ever by faith fulfilled their portion have not yet fully ever held possession of a hundred percent of that land. Something always stood in their way. But God, who walked between those animals, brought the descendants of Abram out of Egypt into what we call the Holy Land today so that they could take possession of that land. And, and we really, until you get to the book of Joshua, they don't even enter into that land it takes them years even to find the opportunity to step foot into this land to possess it. Your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, 
the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Katamite and the Hetite and the Prezerite and the Raphaim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. All of those city-states or kings or cities, all of those would be given 400 years of probation to accept by faith the God of Abraham, or they would be driven out of the land. Now, I also want to say this. Please keep in mind, this is, I think, profoundly important. The reason Israel was placed in this location in the Middle East is because what we call the Holy Land today in the time of Abram and in the time Israel did possess it was the central trade route for the known civilized world. That they would be the center of the northern and the southern and the eastern lands would all be intersecting and they would be walking through the Holy Land, meeting God's people. And in meeting God's people, they would meet God and they were placed there not to benefit for self, selfish reasons. Not to say, look at me, look at this great land I possess. They were to be placed there to pro proclaim the truth of the Creator God to the known world. Remember Abraham, everywhere he went, he built an altar and had a public worship service. I want you to have this image in your mind that the purpose of the descendants of Abraham placed in this geographic location on the planet, my friends, which would come in 430 years, was to proclaim the truth of a God who saves you by faith alone. I find that to be absolutely profound. Fascinating. Now, today, we have the church, and what is the purpose of the church? To make that proclamation to the world that we are saved by faith alone. I want to go to our closing picture. This is just continuing on that Highway 97, just north of that prairie. I want you to notice the volcanic activity and, and certainly all of those pockets and bubbles that are existing in that hillside where the wild horses live. And you can see that beautiful grass. Thank you, Sherry, for taking us there. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Sorry if I didn't pronounce everything correctly. I hope you'll go back and learn how to do it yourself. This was a great Thank you for watching today. today. Our email address is ScreamingRockMinistries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.